if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We're going to get there in just a second. We're going to start in Isaiah 9, verse 6, but the whole uh, first seven verses of Isaiah 9 are really, really amazing. Every verse in the Bible is amazing. I know that, you know that, but for whatever reason, as we were reading these verses this week, I just got really, really excited about all seven of these verses. In fact, uh, my daughter came home from college and I was super excited. I was like, AGB, you got to see these verses. And we got talking about it and, and AGB went crazy and we made this little card of these seven verses. And so we put them on the corners of the tables when you leave today. If you need a copy of these seven verses, we made them for you. So just grab one of those uh, on your way out. I want to welcome you to the fourth Sunday of Advent. Our days of waiting to celebrate our coming king are narrowing, right? Christmas Day, Saturday. Um, so we have five days or so, six days to prepare ourselves, to further ready our hearts, to further ready our homes. Our Advent series, if you've been with us the last few weeks, our Advent series is called The Beauty in the In-Between. Uh, we've been waiting for our king who has come and for the king who is coming again. We are learning to live in the reality of the beauty of the in-between. We began this season talking about waiting. We talked about waiting in hope. You might remember this. We anchored our waiting in the posture of hope. The psalmist wrote these words, Psalm 33, 22, may your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. The second week of Advent, we talked about peace, talked a lot about God's peace, anchored ourselves in that week around peace. Jesus said these words, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. My peace I give you, the shalom of the triune God, Jesus said. Last week, uh, was the halfway point of our Advent journey. We celebrated joy. The pink candle reminds us it's really supposed to be a rose candle. There it goes. Just burned out. The rose candle reminds us of joy. Let's see if I can get it going here. There it goes. Uh, Matt just read from Luke chapter 2, verse 10. When the angel appeared to the shepherds, the angel said, Hey, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will be great joy for all people. And then Jesus prayed these words, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Not only does Jesus instill us with his hope and then give us his peace, he enables us to live in the full measure of his joy. And now today we come to this fourth Sunday of Advent, and we light the candle that represents love. Jesus said these words, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must also love one another. I want us to think about this for just a second. I don't want us just to light candles and stuff and then like move on. I want us to think about this for a second. I want to ask you a couple of questions about God's love. As I have loved you, he says, as I have loved you, so you also love one another. So let me ask you, how has he loved you? How has God loved you? How has he loved you? How is he loving you right now in the here and now? How is he loving you? And thirdly, how will he love you? Will we just think about that for a second? Maybe you could just think about it. How has he loved you? How is he loving you? He gave us his peace. One expression of his love was to give us his peace, my peace I give you. He gave us his joy that you may have complete joy. He gave us his life, celebrate that. He gave us his love. He gave us his son. God gave us his son. This verse that I mentioned a moment ago, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, says these words. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
Prince of Peace. I want you to hear me say this morning that the pressure is off. I'm going to say it again because I'm not sure if everybody's with me here. The pressure is off. The pressure is off. Why? Because he's come. The pressure is off, you guys, because he's here. The pressure, is come, uh, the pressure is off because he's come. This is who he is. This is who our God is. I want you to hear me say today that the pressure is off. How about we do this? How about we tell the person sitting next to you, the pressure is off. Go ahead, tell the person sitting next to you, the pressure is off. The pressure's off. The pressure's off. Not everybody did it. Is that because we don't believe it? Or I could just... Oh, seriously, I could just feel freedom from a wife when the husband says to the wife, honey, the pressure is off. Or freedom for a husband to hear the wife say, honey, the pressure is off. And for us to live in that reality as a single person, as a divorced person, as a person with cancer, the pressure is off. Because he has come because of who he is, the pressure is off. That's what I want to talk about today. I love this. I love this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. I just want to look at this just one phrase at a time. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. I love this. God's answer to everything that has ever terrorized us is a child. The people of Israel, the people of God, were being terrorized by the Assyrians, for example, in this text, by the Babylonians. We talked about those guys a couple of weeks ago and all the other big shots and all the other bullies of this world. And God's answer was not to become an even bigger bully. God's answer was a child. To us, to us, a son is born. To us, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And Jesus tells us why. Why? Why would God do this? John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says these words, For God so loved, this is why, for God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his one and only son, that anyone, everyone, whoever, the whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God was motivated by love for whoever would believe in his saving power and his healing power and his redemptive power. He wasn't motivated by anger or motivated by judgment or motivated by condemnation. His motivation to save the whole world was love. So he gave freely. He gave fully to you and to me. Because of his saving grace, the pressure is off. Okay, one more time. Tell the person sitting next to you. The pressure is off. We're starting to get warmed up now. Go ahead. Go ahead. You guys getting this? You with me? Are you guys with me? Okay, the first hour wasn't with me, so I had to give the whole sermon two times. So you got to be with me here. The pressure is off. Pressure is off. I've shared with you, many of you, my, uh, some, of my, uh, some of my story. Uh, it's a bumpy story, but it's, uh, it's God's story. Uh, when I was a little kid, my parents were in ministry. Uh, my parents eventually got divorced and left the ministry. My mom didn't want to have anything to do with ministry, but my dad loved the ministry. My dad loved the local church. And in that season, my brother and I went really nuts, like totally nuts, like stereotypical pastor kid nuts. That was my brother and I. And we got into all kinds of trouble, and everybody knew it. My dad met a widow who also loved ministry. And when they got married, they pursued full-time ministry together. Uh, Some of you guys know this. You guys know like when we here at Sanctuary, when we're about to call for new elders, um, we say to you guys, hey, we wanna make sure that you guys know who our elders are. And we wanna make sure that you feel like these elders meet the criteria of a shepherd, of an overseer, of an elder. And we always read this passage of scripture. Let me just read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. And if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? I'll never forget this. A person heard that my 
dad wanted to be in ministry again, and a person, that person knew this passage of scripture. That person also knew that my brother and I were totally nuts and out of control. And that person said to my dad, if you can't save your own kids, how are you supposed to save the unsaved kids in the neighborhood? And my dad said these words, never forget. My dad said these words. They are not mine to save. They are mine to love. I'm getting the chills just thinking about it. Parents, they are not yours to save. They are yours to love. There are many of us around here striving as if the world were ours to save. It's not yours to save. It's yours to love. There are many of us running around here like we think we're the only one, that if no one else says it, if no one else does it, it's not yours to save. It's yours to love. I think you guys know this, but can I just remind you really quickly, parents, you can't save your kid. Husbands, you can't save your wife. They're not yours to save. They're yours to love. You can't save your brother-in-law, you can't save your boss, you can't save your employer, you can't save your employee or your neighbor. Jesus didn't tell us to save your neighbor just as I saved you. Jesus said, love your neighbor just as I love you. The pressure is off to cure or to fix or to resolve or to carry or to hold everything together. The pressure is off for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Real quick question. Look at this verse. Whose shoulders? Say it out loud. Who? His shoulders. Not your shoulders. Whose shoulders? His shoulders. I was asked to pray the other day at the uh, Cobb County Commissioner's meeting uh, down on the square. And uh, I thought, well, this ought to be interesting, you know of going to pray for these guys. And I got there a little bit early and I was kind of watching what was going on and all these people were rushing around. They were carrying all of these file folders and everybody was like, you know, running to get somewhere. And the friend that invited me to pray over their meeting came over to me and she said, we've actually prepared for like five hours in advance for this one hour meeting. I was like, dang, that's a lot, you know. And I just, I just kind of looked around and thought, geez, And I wasn't exactly sure what to pray. So I just prayed this. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And as I was leaving, I started to think about what do I carry on my shoulders that is not mine to carry? Who is it that I'm trying to save that is not mine to save? And why? I came up with a pretty good list. You would probably come up with a good list yourself if you had time to think about it. I was kind of playing it through in my head as I was leaving that meeting. I was kind of thinking, what do I carry on my shoulders? I came up with a pretty good list. The happiness of my wife and kids I often carry on my shoulders the spiritual vitality of our church. I mean, I'm the pastor. I'm the husband. I'm the dad. If, I mean, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? The hurting hearts of my friends and neighbors. And why? Why? Well, I, was, I was raised to believe that it was all mine to carry. My fear tells me that it's mine to carry. Expectations of others around me tell me that it's mine to carry. And then there is this inherent sense that says, if I don't carry it all, who else will? What will happen? So let me ask again. What do you take on your shoulders? What do you carry that isn't yours to carry? I'm not sure, you know, if you're able to, if you're able to articulate an answer right now, but if you've come with someone who knows you really well, you could just ask them, because they'll tell you. (laughs) 
Yes? The pressure is off because Jesus has come. Jesus says these words, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. He's not just talking about sin. I think he might be talking about this stuff. This stuff that we carry, this stuff that we put on our shoulders, this stuff we say, we gotta save the whole world. Peter, someone who saw Jesus carry the weight of the world, said this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He doesn't say carry it. He doesn't say put it on your shoulders. Just cast it. Unburden yourself. Unburden yourself. What is burdening you and causing you to be weary and heavy laden that's not yours to carry? This Christmas season is a beautiful season, but for many of us, it is full of pressure. Pressure to look good on our Christmas cards. A pressure to buy just the right gift. Husbands, it, maybe you can relate to me. Pressure to just buy the right gift. My wife, and now my kids, have taken the pressure off of me. Do you know what they do? My wife sends me, a, goes to the store and sends me a picture of the thing that she wants and texts it to me. The pressure's off, man. All I gotta do is go pay for it. My kids, I don't know if any of your kids do this, my kids send me a link I click the link, download the, the pressure is off. It's, it's legit. I mean, I'm thinking like, this is the greatest thing ever. The pressure is off. But so many of us, pressure to meet expectations, pressure to get the best grades, or to be fast enough to make the team, or to be slim enough to fit into the outfit, Pressure to give just the right amount of time to your family and to your in-laws' family. Pressure that your kids will behave or that you will behave. Could I, should I keep going or are you with me? I want you to hear me say that the pressure is off. There isn't anything for you to save nothing for you to carry especially not your anxiety because Jesus is the only one who can save Jesus is the only one who can heal Jesus is the only one who can redeem and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace just look at these names for just a minute this is who he is he is our wonderful counselor it literally means wonder of a counselor our ruler Jesus's counsel would transcend human wisdom he would not need anyone else to counsel him or to guide him Jesus advised us for example not to worry about tomorrow for tomorrow has enough trouble of its own Jesus counseled us for example that there is strength in weakness there is victory in surrender and there is life in death Jesus is our mighty God Jesus would possess all power, all majesty, all the grandeur, all the strength, all the forgiveness of God dwells in Jesus. He wouldn't just be the father of a nation in the sense that Israel's kings were. He would be our eternal father whose paternal reign of love would last forever because Jesus is God. He would be our prince of peace. The monarch whose coming results in peace would be experienced between God and man between man and man, and between us and our truest selves, the truest form of shalom. The pressure is off because Jesus has come and Jesus will come again. Now, if you have your Bible, slide up to verse one, Isaiah nine, verse one. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. Golly, this is good news. Can we just stop here? This is really good news. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. The Hebrew reads this. The Hebrew of this phrase reads this way. Indeed, there is no more gloom for the one to whom there was anxiety. 
In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. He has not come to condemn those who are distressed. He's not come to kick them to the curb because they're not spiritual enough. He's actually come to honor those who are in distress. Now, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Any of you know darkness? Uh, any of you know darkness? Some of you don't just know darkness, some of you know deep darkness. Deep darkness, it says, a light has dawned. Parker Palmer is this popular writer who wrote one of my favorite books. In it, he writes about his three bouts with depression uh, as an adult. He fought through depression three times. He simply said, there aren't any words to describe that kind of darkness. And conversely, he says, there simply aren't words to describe the kind of beauty that is experienced when light dawns in the deep darkness. Verse 3, you have enlarged the nations and increased their joy. We don't just have a static joy. We're not just given a certain amount of joy that's your joy. We are given an increasing amount of joy. We rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. This is what our Savior does. He increases our capacity for joy, even as we get older. Jesus says, my joy, yours. Your joy, complete, complete joy. Verse 4, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. This is what our Savior has already done. He's already shattered the yoke, the bar across your shoulders. So why are you still carrying it? He breaks the bar across our shoulders so that we can learn to live freely and lightly in the here and now. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, verse 7. I want us to all read verse 7 out loud. Okay, are we ready? All of us out loud? Here we go. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the beauty of the in-between. The pressure is off, for the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish all that needs to be accomplished. His will and his way will prevail. You don't have to carry it. You don't have to shoulder it. And you can't save it. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish all of this. I'll close here in just a moment. But before I do, I just, I just, I just want you to sit in this for a second. What would it look like for you to unburden yourself this morning? Like, what would it look like? to cast all of your anxiety on him, knowing that he cares for you? What would it take for you to fully entrust him with everything that you're carrying? Believing that he's good and that you can trust him with all that you're carrying. I want to, in just a moment, invite you to pray and sing and remember Jesus through his sacrifice, the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that truly sets us free. I want to invite you in just a moment, if you want to, to take communion. Uh, there's some stations around the table, and there's one up here. What I really want to invite you is to pray. I was thinking about these three prayers. Maybe in these moments, you might pray, Jesus, I'm casting upon you 
this. Care. Just, I'm just giving it to you. Maybe in these moments, it's literally, I am taking this off my shoulders and I'm giving it to you. I don't want to carry it anymore. It's not mine to carry. Or maybe it's just saying this, Jesus, I am fully giving myself to you today. So let's just sit in silence for a moment. And then I'll pray and then Sonny will lead us. And you respond as Jesus invites you to respond. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for hearing our prayers. And I'm just praying representatively for all of us here, Jesus. I'm just, I'm casting our care. I'm casting all of our anxieties, knowing that you care for us, casting them to you. Jesus, this representatively of my friends, our faith family, I'm, I'm taking this off my shoulders and giving it to you. We're giving it to you. We don't want to carry it anymore. It's not ours to carry. And representatively, Jesus, I'm giving myself fully to you. We are giving ourselves fully, wholly to you today. We pray in Jesus' name.